Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Wendy Elliott Vandeveer. Um, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity to speak with you today during this amazing celebration of Disability Pride Month and the 30th anniversary of the ADA. Thank you to Vicki Landers and the folks at Disability Pride Philly for your strong commitment to expanding access, opportunities, and justice for people with disabilities. Just want to give a little image description and my pronouns are she and her. Um, I'm a middle-aged white woman with curly red, reddish brown hair and glasses. I'm wearing a red dress and I have a butterfly pin on because butterflies are one of my favorite things. Um, I'm an artist and an advocate in the disability community for over 40 years as well as a professional working in the civil rights and human resources areas. I served in leadership positions as president of Disabled in Action of Pennsylvania, uh, chair of the Philadelphia Mayor's Commission on People with Disabilities. I was on the board of the American Association of People with Disabilities, and I'm currently on the board of the local chapter of uh, Philadelphia chapter for United Spinal. I'm also a wife, mother, uh, animal lover, and general pain in the butt. I've making, uh, been making art my whole life. Um, I would always make drawings, paintings, and sculptures since I was a small child. It was something that I enjoyed doing and it came easily for me. As a child, I took classes in Philadelphia at the School Art League, um, as well as Cheltenham Art Center. And when it came time for me to go to college, I won the Philadelphia Board of Ed Scholarship in art and also the Philadelphia City Scholarship for my extracurricular and community activities. These scholarships enabled me to go to college for free and I graduated with honors magna cum laude from Tyler School of Art of Temple University where I majored in sculpture and also dabbled in painting, photography and other areas. And I've continued to make my art over the last several decades. My paintings explore issues of family, memory and experiences as a disabled woman and my autobiographical cartoons focus on attitudinal barriers and stereotypes regarding disabilities and some of the microaggressions that disabled people experience while we're just trying to live our normal quote uninspirational lives. Um, all of my work is based on true real life experiences. I always say that I, I couldn't make this stuff up. Um, I paint and draw my reality and I use humor to help educate others and to cultivate disability pride. We as a community need to work to break down the barriers and prevent, that prevent people with disabilities from fully participating in the mainstream of our society. Historically, people with disabilities have been isolated and insulated in our communities, going to separate segregated schools, riding on separate and unequal transportation systems, and living in the most restrictive institutional settings. And many barriers, as you know, have begun to erode over the last several decades. It's not so unusual to see people with disabilities out there in our communities, working, shopping at malls, going to the movies, eating out at restaurants, all things that I like to do, although not in the uh, uh, era of the coronavirus. Uh, today, thanks to the ADA, uh, most of the new construction is barrier free. Uh, I no longer have to dehydrate myself practically when I go out for the day to the movies or, or shopping and so forth. <clears throat> Most new facilities have accessible restrooms. Uh, clothing stores have dressing rooms that you can fit your wheelchair inside. Uh, movie theater management no longer tell me that I'm a fire hazard for hanging out in the aisle. Uh, newer movie theaters now have wheelchair accessible seats even though a lot of times they're in the back row or the, the center row. And there are curb cuts at most major intersections, uh, although uh, the ones in Philly have, uh, have an, a need for a lot of repair. And in some parts of our city, you can actually take a train uh, or a lift equipped bus. I was a leader in Philadelphia in the late 70s, early 80s to force SEPTA to put lifts on buses. We demonstrated throughout the city blocking major intersections, and we even took over a SEPTA board meeting. Um, I was never arrested for any of these activities, mainly because paddy wagons were not accessible back then. So lucky for me. 
Um, at that time, um, at the same time, we still have much work to be done to make the dream of the ADA become a reality. So many of our brothers and sisters are forced to live in nursing homes. We still remain second class citizens when it comes to voting. Many polling places and voting machines are inaccessible and we're expected to be satisfied with vo voting by absentee ballot. And absentee ballots um, are also very difficult for people who are blind or visually impaired. And we are yet to achieve economic empowerment. About 70% of us are currently unemployed, the highest unemployment rate for any group in this nation. Yet most people um, outside of our community don't even talk about this statistic. In the age of COVID-19, I hope that disabled folks do not get pushed to the back of the bus when it comes to employment and returning to work. Companies are discovering that many workers can perform their jobs successfully at home, an accommodation that disabled people have been crying out for for years. And it's not something that all disabled people necessarily need, but I think it's something that should be available as an option. Advocacy for me started at an early age. I've been disabled since birth. I have spina bifida and I use a, a motorized wheelchair uh, full time for mobility. And unlike many of my peers at the time, I grew up in a very mainstreamed environment. I think I was mainstream before the term was even coined. Um, I grew, I, I went to regular public schools in Philadelphia, where I was always the only disabled kid in the school. And I refused to go to Widener, a special segregated school for children with disabilities. Um, I wanted to go to the same school as other kids on my block. And my parents were very supportive in this. My mother would, would go to school with me every day. She helped me climb the steps to the inaccessible school that I attended. And she helped me you know, every day in the, in the bathroom. So she really made it possible uh, for me to go uh, to the regular school in my neighborhood. Uh, looking back on my life, I, I sometimes feel now that I was very driven and almost uh, always trying to overcome, quote unquote, overcome my disability. Uh, for example, in high school, I was a straight A student. I got involved in all sorts of extracurricular activities, short of joining the, the football team. If I could have done that, I probably would have done that too. Um, I was class treasurer of a class of 1,100 students. Um, art editor of the school magazine, and, and on and on. Um, I was really sickening. Um, but I found that I was often judged because of my disabilities rather than my abilities. For example, um, I would invariably get the most courageous student award, uh, which was, in my opinion, a token disabled person award. Um, I got the award for the first time when I was in sixth grade, and they gave me an oil paintings box, uh, a full set of oil paints, and I was thrilled with it because I'm an artist. Um, and I remember that when I was about to graduate from high school, I had the feeling that I would again be getting this courageous award. Uh, but this time I had my rejection speech ready. Uh, however, when they announced that the award would be for uh, $100, I decided to take the money because uh, I'm a, a real woman of principle. Uh, interestingly, I never knew any other people with disabilities when I grew up. I had virtually no role models. Um, it wasn't until I was 18 years old and a freshman in college that I got involved in the disability rights community. I became president of Disabled in Action of Pennsylvania and I continued with my advocacy both within and outside the system for almost 40 years. Um, in college, I continued to be a hellraiser. Uh, when I was in college, uh, the uh, ADA regulations uh, finally uh, were in effect and the school was supposed to develop or, or uh, produce their transition plan. And I remember that when I went to, when I would go to school, the, um, they refused to provide me with an accessible parking space. And I would get there early and take the Dean's spot. Um, I quickly got his attention um, after doing this. And now after I graduated, you know, many years later, there were ramps into all, you know, every entrance of the building, uh, but I, I think that they were glad to see me leave. Um, I've been a working professional in the civil rights and human resources for several major corporations uh, for many years. Again, I've always had to continue to fight and educate others about disability issues, and it's not always easy, 
Um, I feel like a pioneer, the same as I did when I was in school where I was always the only person with a disability. Uh, but my experience really wasn't typical. Um, as I mentioned before, the unemployment rate for our 61 million disabled Americans is about 70%. And among those with disabilities that do work, the average earnings are 35% less than the earnings for workers without disability disabilities. Uh, no minority group in America has such a dismal record of participation in the labor force as do people with disabilities. Most of us want to work, um, yet we've been underutilized, underemployed, and underrepresented in the workplace. But why, after 30 years since the passage of the ADA, do we still see such chronic unemployment? Um, even though we have all these wonderful laws on the books, we have 504, the ADA, uh, we can't legislate attitudes. Probably one of the most important issues is still, even after 30 years, is still attitudinal barriers or the stereotypes <clears throat> and the misconceptions that society in general maintains about people with disabilities. There are many attitudinal barriers that need to be battered down through education. And I created my cartoons, <clears throat> excuse me, to shine a light on some of the attitudinal barriers that I myself have personally experienced. For many non-disabled, for many non-disabled people, um, when they're confronted with people with disabilities, for example, they tend to um, regard these individuals as having more physical and even mental limitations than actually exist. Uh, they may try to be overly helpful, uh, pushing people across the street, holding doors open and so forth, regardless of whether or not the person actually needs the assistance. I have a friend who's blind who often jokes about pe how people have come up to her at a busy intersection and forcefully insisted on helping her and her guide dog across the street. And she said that she's been helped across many a street that she didn't even want to cross. Uh, but if you see me coming with my heavy briefcase on my lap, which, which I did when I was working in corporate America, I won't mind if you hold the door open for me. It's just a common courtesy, but the best thing is to ask first um, or if the need seems obvious. Uh, but respect the person's right to indicate the kind of help that they need. Another thing that happens to me a lot is that people with dis people without disabilities sometimes tend to avoid people with disabilities or consider their companions to be conversational go-betweens. For example, when a person talks only to the non-disabled person that accompany that's accompanying the individual with the disability. Um, I've had this experience uh, traveling on an airplane uh, when the flight attendant uh, once asked my manager at the time who was traveling with me, can she transfer into a regular seat or is that her wheelchair? And I would sometimes answer in the third person, yes, that's her wheelchair. And I've also experienced this a lot uh, lately with my husband where people ask him, can I pet your dog when I'm sitting right there? Sometimes I feel invisible in these situations, and one of my cartoons that I'm going to show you in a, in a few minutes tells this story. Uh, but fortunately, this kind of thing doesn't happen to me very often. Especially now that I have my service dog, uh, Lucy, who appears in a lot of my cartoons and her predecessors also appear in the cartoons. I found that strangers will actually come up and talk to me. Uh, people that I don't even want to talk to <laughs> come up and talk to me. Uh, the dog is kind of a social lubricant. Whereas in the past, people might look away or stare at me out of the corner of their eye. I've suddenly uh, become the center of attraction with my service dog. Uh, but sometimes uh, this has its downsides too. Some people will run up and start petting the dog uh, without asking for my permission, um, or they may yell out, hi, Lucy. Um, Lucy's harness has a, a badge that says, please don't pet me, I'm working. And sometimes I feel like adding another badge that says, say hi to Wendy. Uh, with service dogs, like guide dogs, it's best not to pet the dog or yell out at them while they're working. It can be very distracting for the dog um, and it could be very dangerous for the person as well, depending on the situation, like my friend who was crossing the street with her guide dog. One of the funniest experiences that I ever had with my service dog uh, was when I was traveling on the Pennsylvania Turnpike with another manager and we were on our way to an unemployment hearing, which is something I did a lot as an HR manager. 
Um, I was driving my little red Honda Civic. And when I stopped at the toll booth to pay, and there were, as this is at the time when there were still people in the toll booth, uh, the attendant said, said to me, is that your seeing eye dog? And I quickly responded, yeah, he told me to get off at this exit. Um, another important consideration is terminology. It's one of the things that I love to talk about, uh, the types of words that we use to describe people with disabilities. I created another, another cartoon that I'm gonna show you that directly addresses this issue. Uh, for example, avoid using words that have negative connotations, like saying somebody is uh, confined to their wheelchair um, or, they're, or they're wheelchair bound. When I hear these words, I think of somebody that's bound and tied up, gagged in their wheelchair, when in reality, the wheelchair is a source of freedom and mobility. <laughs> my son described it best. Uh, my son is, uh, is a man now, but when he was four years old, he used to say to me, you're just not standable, mom. Like I was some kind of bendable, twistable, gumby mom. And I have another cartoon, I'm gonna show you this too. I really loved his pronouncement. Um, there was a lot of clarity to it. And it showed that he did not view me um, or my disability in a negative way. I was just not a standable mom. Uh, or we may tend to uh, use words that euphemize, saying that somebody is stricken with multiple sclerosis, or they're a victim of cerebral palsy. Uh, these words might be very dramatic. They might've been useful in the old days when they had the, the Jerry Lewis telethon, which happily is no longer in existence. Um, they tended to portray people with disabilities in a very negative light, as if our lives were constantly frustrating tragedies. And very few of us actually view ourselves uh, this way. We're just living our lives like anyone else. Some of the other words that I personally can't stand are physically inconvenienced, differently abled, physically challenged, and then handy capable, one of the more egregious words. Uh, these words, words are all a little too cute, uh, sugar-coated. They don't tell it like it is. I wish that we could just say the word, say the word disability. Uh, the best terminology for me personally is a disabled person with a capital D for disabled. Uh, because it's part of my identity. Uh, I also like uh, to be called a wheelchair user at times, but we have to also remember that terminology is a constantly evolving thing, and we have to respect uh, what types of terminology a particular group wants to be called, <coughs> because again, it's part of our identity. My feeling is the only way to break down some of these attitudinal barriers for, is for people with disabilities to continue to get out there in our communities, become more visible in the workplace. Um, and I believe that this process of education is, is often a two-way street. Uh, the responsibility for positive interaction between a non-disabled person and a disabled person is two-sided. Sometimes I personally find this exhausting, but we as disabled people uh, often need to educate others who may be well-meaning, uh, but they lack the knowledge and awareness of disability. Um, in my own personal life, I've never separated my art from my advocacy. Um, it's all about um, tikkun olam, which means repairing the world, making it a better, uh, more accessible, and just world for all of us. And at this point, I'm going to show you um, some examples of my art. Hey, can everybody see the first slide? Yes. Yes, okay. So um, I get inspiration from my cartoons by just getting out there in public and doing normal things like going to work and getting out of my van, uh, eating out at restaurants, going to the doctor and so forth. Um, obviously I'm not getting a lot of inspiration right now during COVID since I'm basically in the house all the time. And uh, sometimes I'm, I'm unable to think of a good response at the time to the insensitive remarks or conduct of others. So the, in this cartoon, which was one of my <coughs> earlier cartoons, um, I started writing down things that people said to me when I was getting out of my car going to work. And I started um, writing them down on a little app on my cell phone, not quite sure what I was gonna do with them. And eventually I would turn them into a cartoon. Um, so in this cartoon, I'll give you a little visual um, description. Um, it shows um, me in my wheelchair, 
Um, and my service dog is in the center and the service dog has three heads that represent different emotions. He's uh, angry, growling in one, uh, he's puzzled, uh, sticking his tongue out, razzing, and uh, then generally looking confused. And these are actual things that people have said to me. Um, so uh, they would say, hi, beautiful, and really talking about the dog, or it's good to see you out today, like they let me out of the, uh, the home for the day. Um, I don't know how many times I've heard the comment, you're going to get a speeding ticket, or you're, you're going to need a, uh, to get a horn on that thing, uh, or you want to race. It's just it's kind of endless. Uh, uh, they've also said things like, I don't think of you as disabled. And the uh, service dog is growling back, I don't think of you as enlightened, or you're so inspirational. And the dog is saying, I'll make you inspirational. Um, one of the, uh, somebody uh, said to me once, uh, it's people like you who put my life in perspective. And this was a guy that just came up to my van as I was getting out onto the lift, about to descend out into the, the parking lot. And he had to come up to me and make this comment. Like, you know, his, his life could be uh, worse. He could be me. So, um, or uh, people have said to me, I'll pray for you. Jesus loves you. And the dog is saying, aren't we Jewish, mom? Um, or they'll say, what happened to you? Or good for you. Like, you know, I could be swimming in a pool at the, you know, at the gym. And when I finish the lap, somebody puts their thumb up and says, good for you. So it, it's kind of endless, <laughs> the things that people say. Um, and I also I often use the cartoons in the in the um, I use animals in the in the cartoons uh, mostly my service dog is kind of an alter ego or um, comic insult dog to communicate things that are sometimes difficult for me to say in, in public. Um, so on this, in this one um, it shows um, a, me in a wheelchair in a my younger days in a more uh, pared down fashionable wheelchair at the time. And there's a tall, dark, handsome man uh, to my left. And he says, what happened to you? And I say, I used to dance with the Bolshoi Ballet. During a performance one night, I slipped and fell off the, off the stage. I landed in the orchestra pit and a conductor's wand severed my spine. But what I'm really thinking in the, in the thought bubble is nothing, what happened to you? So I'm just, you know, amazed that, you know, the people will sometimes have the gall to come up and ask, you know, personal questions. They want to know, you know, how, you know, how, what happened to you? And uh, I used to make up all kinds of bizarre stories like the Bolshoi Ballet story to, you know, to get people off my back. Uh, the next one, <clears throat> the next one talks about uh, the terminology. Um, here you have, um, five uh, little Wendy's in wheelchairs. Uh, they all have reddish hair or orangey hair. Uh, the first one is holding a big um, globe on her head, a big atlas on her head, um, and it says physically challenged. So this is my, what I think of like somebody that's holding the whole world on their head when they're physically challenged. Uh, the next one um, is differently abled. Um, here the person has an extra arm. Uh, they have a extra eye, um, a unicorn horn. So they've got some real different abilities going on here. Um, the third one shows wheelchair bound. I'm literally bound and gagged in my wheelchair. Um, and then after that, uh, there's someone that's confined to their wheelchair. They're, they're tied up with a, um, have a, have a lock with chains around their, their shoulders and their legs. That's confined to a wheelchair. And then the final one, has uh, me with my arms up, my fingers straight out, and I'm smiling broadly. And it says, I'm free in my wheelchair. Because the reality is that the wheelchair is a source of freedom and mobility. It's not what people think. It's not something that's necessarily a confining thing. <clears throat> if I didn't have the wheelchair, I would be in bed all the time. And then this one is about another um, awful term, handy capable. And this cartoon is a little bit uh, not appropriate for, for kids, but um, uh, the person is sitting in a wheelchair with their both arms uh, up. Uh, they're making a very defiant pose with their middle fingers 
out and the middle fingers are, um, it says censored over each of them. So this person is uh, very capable, especially with their uh, making the F, F word with their fingers. <laughs> Um, here's another one that's human resource related and a and, uh, problem about employment discrimination. Um, it shows me in a wheelchair uh, with my uh, wearing a, a green, like an olive green suit and uh, my service dog is, is sitting behind me um, and then I'm pulled up in front of a desk where the, the uh, interviewer, a, a white male with gray hair and I've just handed in my resume and the dog is behind me with his resume in his mouth. And the, the text reads uh, for myself, I'm a human resources professional with over 25 years of experience in multiple industries. I have a SPHR and SHRM SCP certifications. My diverse background combines work in the federal government, private industry and community advocacy. And the dog um, at the same time is very experienced. And he, he says, I'm a certified service dog with over eight years of experience as a VP of dog operations management with a concentration in employee relations. Woof, woof. And, but what do you think the, uh, uh, the white old man in the, uh, behind the desk, the interviewer is thinking, she's in a wheelchair, she has a dog. Uh, sometimes I think that's all they see when I first come into the room because I, I don't tell people before I get there that I'm in a wheelchair. And I still believe that, you know, that I can win them over by talking about, you know, what I bring to the table, what my, you know, experience is and how I could help them. So again, um, employment, you know, continues to be a very uh, difficult issue for us uh, people with disabilities. Uh, the next one, um, this is about uh, how I often feel, you know, invisible when um, non-disabled people will talk to the person that's accompanying me or not even accompanying me in this situation. Um, here we have <coughs> myself in the wheelchair with my dog in front of me. And then there's a um, middle-aged woman wearing a purple shirt um, and she is tapping her hand um, against an, a man uh, who's got his turned the other direction. He's on the cell phone, he's looking up, not paying attention at all to the situation. And she's asking this total stranger, can I pet your dog? And I'm totally shocked, which is what happens to me all the time. I'm just going, huh? I mean, my mouth drops open. Uh, but the dog is saying, woof the, expletive deleted. Why don't you ask her? So again, this doesn't happen to me a lot of times, but very often, you know, people will, you know, ask my husband, can I pet your dog? And it just irks me to no end. Um, here's another one of my pet peeves. This is about accessible parking, especially van accessible parking. Uh, when I try to go get a parking space half the time at a grocery store or at, or at a mall, the parking spaces are, uh, that are van accessible are always taken or they're not quite wide enough to accommodate my lift. So in this uh, cartoon, it shows <coughs> a, a car. It's kind of like a maroon color car. And there's a woman uh, running out of the car uh, wearing red sneakers, a red tank top and blue shorts. Her hair is flying in a, in a ponytail and she's wearing a sweatband. And she's, her, her, uh, what she's thinking is, got a great parking space. And there's a, a little uh, skeleton-like <laughs> figure in, uh, in the front who has a cane and a little um, uh, bonnet on and the, the, the tagline reads, grandma's been dead for years, but her parking privileges live on. And the car actually says, uh, the license plate on the car says entitled. So just an, um, an issue that I think, you know, needs to be brought to light more. There's a lot of abuse, uh, um, even though there are a lot of people that have invisible disabilities that use these spaces. But if you see somebody like running out of their car like this lady, you know, I think there's a lot of misuse with accessible parking. Um, so it's, it's just something to also to be aware of. Um, here's another true story uh, about a time when I went to get an ultrasound. And here you have <coughs> an ultrasound tech <coughs> on the left side uh, with her ultrasound machine. I'm in the middle in my wheelchair but wearing a purple shirt again. And my service dog is, um, this is when Lucy, my current service dog was a puppy. 
um, I put her in the cartoon so that the uh, words are uh, from the ultrasound tech. She asks, how did you get here? And I said, I drove my van. And she says back to me, that's amazing. You're so inspirational. Um, and the dog is saying, they beamed us up on an intergalactic spaceship. So the dog is always interjecting some uh, snarky, sarcastic humor in the situation. Um, here's another true story. Um, oftentimes people will ask, you know, about praying for me or that Jesus loves you. And uh, here I'm at a, eating out at a, an Italian restaurant. Uh, I'm sitting there with my husband. Um, I made myself a little younger, thinner, longer hair. <laughs> Um, my, the service dog is under the table, and we have a big a bottle of red wine on the table and two glasses uh, filled with wine. And the waiter uh, slash owner of the restaurant, this is a true story, he comes up to the, to the table and asks me, do you ever pray for something better? And I kind of looked at him because I didn't know what, you know, what are you talking about? And he says, you know, to not need a wheelchair. And I responded to him. I said, I have everything I need. I'm sitting here with my husband, my family, my son and daughter-in-law were also present. And it's true, I have everything I need. Um, but the dog, um, he had to put his two cents in. He said, I need some chicken Marcella with a side of penny. Um, here's another one about pseudo service animals. There are a lot of people that try to pawn off all kinds of uh, animals, you know, peacocks and micro pigs and take them on airplanes and uh, claiming that they're uh, service animals. Um, here my service dog um, is on the left side wearing a red vest and he's saying woof the, he's, and again there's a lot of cursing in my cartoons, um, and he's looking at all these pseudo service, service animals. So the first one says comfort cock, uh, ter therapy terrapin, uh, service snake, and there's a huge emotional support elephant, that, which I rendered in a lot of detail. And he, he says emotional support elephant. And hanging from the, <coughs> the tusk of the elephant is a service spider. And it says in parentheses, do not pet. Um, another true story, and I think my son is on the line here too. He's in Taiwan right now uh, with his wife, but uh, this is when he was a baby. Um, a few weeks after giving birth to a baby boy, I, I took him to a party. And so I'm sitting on the left side uh, wearing a bright red dress, holding uh, my baby. Um, he's wearing a little green uh, snuggly, uh, snuggly suit. Um, and then there's a couple kind of ooing and, uh, and oh, uh, goggling over him, oogling and ogling over him on the right side. And a person <coughs> that I didn't know came into the room and she said, and whose child is this? And I just, I couldn't believe it, you know, after I, what I went through to have him and uh, first time that we're out in public, this person makes the assumption that, you know, how could I possibly be, you know, this child's mother? And I think it goes to a lot of the stereotypes and notions about people with disabilities that we're asexual or we can't have sex, uh, we can't get pregnant or have children, uh, we couldn't take care of a child, um, let alone take care of ourselves. Um, I know my own mother, you know, didn't want me to have a baby and I, you know, went ahead and, and did it. But this was a very painful situation. And I, I used that pain and turned it into a cartoon, which was uh, very cathartic for me. And here's a, my son, um, uh, shows me on the left in, in the center. And then in front of me is a little boy looking sort of sideways with his hair, you know, flowing in the wind a little bit. And uh, the text reads, at age four, with great clarity, Wendy's son made a pronouncement. You're just not standable, mom. You know, again, like I'm some kind of bendable, twistable, gumby mom. But I love the statement. I just had to turn it into a cartoon because it was just so genuine. And it just shows that he has no prejudice. He has no judgment about uh, the disability. It was just who mom is, that she's just not standable. And the last one, this is called In a More Perfect World. And this one shows me in the center um, in another wheelchair. Um, this is a manual wheelchair. Um, and I'm wearing a blue dress with a black, uh, I have to tell you, it's a pleather jacket because I'm a vegetarian. I would never wear a leather jacket. Uh, 
<coughs> so it's my pleather jacket, <coughs> and people are saying, you know, good things to me. Um, I see you, I hear you, I appreciate you, I include you, I value you, I welcome you, I respect you, and I'm saying um, in purple again, I thank you. So I hope you, you know, like seeing the cartoons. I want to, you know, open things up if there's any questions or, you know, or comments. Uh, hold on one second. Okay. I know that Kathy Smalls um, has been asking tons of questions. Oh, really? <laughs> so let me get to his first one so we can do this in order. <clears throat> Okay. What is your view of the work from home trends and do you see that as a positive for us? I think it depends on the person's disability. It's not right for everybody. I don't think employers should assume, you know, that all disabled pro people need to work from home, but it is a, a great option for some people uh, with disabilities that, you know, that cannot get out easily, you know, or may not have it, it, the energy. Um, to get out and, you know, to go to a workplace and park and push, you know, blocks to get to the, you know, to the workplace. So I, I think it's a, a great idea. I hope that, you know, employers continue it and make it an option uh, for people with, with disabilities because I think it can help, you know, reverse some of the um, terrible unemployment percentages that we, you know, that we experience as disabled people. Okay, I'm actually going to let him ask you the second question. Let me get him on here. Timothy, are you here? Yes, ma'am. Hi, there sister. You are. Hi. <laughs> um, yeah, now you mentioned, uh, oh, there's so much. First off, I, I have to say I am really, really, really impressed because um, I did not realize that um, as well as being an advocate such as you are, that you had the, uh, I guess you, the word you used was snarky <laughs> mentality. And that's just really kind of, it's very, very positive and very endearing. And I, but I, one thing I, one thing I do want to bring up the ADA parking spaces, cause that's something that I've been, um, I'm like, you know, and they say snitches get stitches, but I mean, I call the cops and they're supposed to be, now I know it changes from state to state, but um, they're supposed to be fines and tickets um, and eventual towings by, um, you know, people who, who abuse ADA parking spaces and they don't have either a, a hanging tag or a license plate. But do you find that, um, if you ever report these guys, do you find that um, law enforcement is slow, if at all, to uh, to enforce this and to actually tow these people? I think that you know we just have to be d diligent and and call people. You know we have to hold people accountable and make sure that these things are enforced. I think <clears throat> I think that's a problem with a lot of our laws that the enforcement. You know if we're not filing a complaint, you know, nothing is going to, you know, to happen if people aren't voluntarily, you know, complying with the laws. So I'd encourage you to keep calling the police and, you know, make sure that they ticket and, you know, possibly tow the person. Thank you, Timothy. Um, so we have a question from Mark Edwards and he asked, have you ever thought of putting your cartoons together in a book? Yeah, that's definitely something that I'm working working on now. I would like to, you know, to create a book and I, I want to, you know, to tell my story and the story of others as well and make it something that's available for disabled people and the non-disabled community to help, you know, to educate them. And I think the way I, you know, I do things in a humorous way with a, using bright color, <coughs> drawing things, <laughs> Uh, realistically shading. I try to draw uh, draw people in, you know, to the th to the things. One to get them to want to look at it, even though the subject matter is really dark, uh, a lot of it. Uh, but I think it's very accessible, you know, to people with and without disabilities. So I, I that's something that I do definitely am uh, I'm working on is you know putting it together in a book. Thank you. 
Um, Janet Bernstein um, said, hello, Wendy. I second your college days self description. You look fantastic. I love your cartoons. Thank you. Um, Mark Edwards said that um, from his comment before about the cartoons in a book, that would be a great teaching tool if you put all of your things into a book. Yes, thank you. Uh, Charlie Carl said, I guess the leather jacket is metaphorical for your kick ass advocacy. Right, right. Even though it's pleather, it's a, it's a met metaphor. <laughs> I love it. Thank you, Charlie. <laughs> um, here's a question. It seems like the concepts of service dogs are being abused. I see people with dogs calling their dogs service just to justify having a pet with them. Please talk more about your experiences you've had in like traveling away from home with, with that. Yeah, I definitely have seen it on, you know, in airplanes or people try to bring their little dogs with them. Um, I wasn't there when the person tried to bring a, a, a peacock on the plane or a, a micro pig, but <laughs> these things uh, happen often. Um, you know, a lot of times people will bring their little yappy dogs uh, into uh, stores um, all the time. And I think they're, you know, taking advantage of a, a something that's really supposed to be designed to help people with disabilities. So there's a lot of, uh, you know, resentment and it kind of cheapens what the whole purpose of, you know, the service animals are. Yes. And there's so, so much um, abuse. Yes. L yesterday, if anybody tuned in, uh, we did a game called ADA Palooza with the Mid-Atlantic ADA Center. Mm -hmm. They were talking about service animals versus emotional support animals. Right. And, um, that, that there's a very, in the ADA, there's a very distinct um, uh, definition, uh, you know, that is different. Um, they said that one of the things that the travel, the people who adhere to the, whatever the agency is for travel, like theirs, they had the very old definition of a service animal could be any animal. So that's why they had to go through this year and actually amend that old rule that's been there forever so mm -hmm. that it is up with the ADA um, and it actually is for um, a service animal can be a dog and sometimes a miniature horse only. Yeah, yeah horses are using them more often and they're, they're large, but the good thing about them is that, you know, they can live for, you know, 30, 40 years and it's, it's very hard losing your, you know, service dog. I've been through it twice. Yeah. <laughs> yes, I, I definitely understand that. Mm -hmm. um, it was one of the great things that we had. Uh, one of the great conversations was um, about service animals, you know, and how, um, the things that you're allowed to get away with and what you're not allowed to get away with. And that right. was the term that somebody used um, and how that was not, um, that was not the way to get, that was not the way of thinking about it, that it was their right to have their service animal there with them, even sitting in a restaurant, mm -hmm. you know? Um, so I think the, the uh, I think there's a lot more education that needs to go out about service animals. Definitely. And having some better um, standards. Um, yes. National standards so that uh, yes. you know, a service animal is, is trained. It's trained and you know knows how to do a lot of things. Like my dogs know about 90 different commands and they, you know, they're trained to assist me with particular things. And they have other, you know, dogs that help people that are blind uh, to navigate the, the streets in our city. They have, um, service dogs that can alert people if they're having a seizure. Um, there's all types of, or hearing dogs. There's, you know, so many different things. Mm -hmm. But again, uh, there's always somebody that, out there that's going to try to, you know, misuse the system, the system. So really, you know, sadly that happens. Yes. Yes. They were talking about <clears throat> a lot of states um, have um, their own policies on what a service animal 
has to have, like a vest. Mm -hmm. you know that it, as part of the ADA, that, that you are, they're not required to, the dog, the dog is not required to wear a vest and you, and, or, and that you do not have to produce paperwork. Right. They can ask, you know, what does the dog, you know, do for you? You know, what kind of task does it do for you? But there's no legal obligation to produce paperwork or, you know, to wear a vest. And a lot of people are also scamming the system by, you know, by buying vests online. So there's... Yes, I think that's, I think that's uh, one of the worst things that, that is out there. Um, is that you can buy, it's just, but you know, it's not, it's, not unlike, um, I hear that you can buy a cop's uniform, which I think is absolutely a horrid idea. Right. Fine. So, um, let's see. Uh, somebody said terminology. I actually used the phrase physically challenged because I thought that was less negative than disabled or handicapped. I say I'm not handicapped because I am not a racehorse. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I think, <laughs> well, there's, you know, terminology again is evolving, you know, handicap uh, came from an old, you know, word called cap in hand, like the person would literally, you know, be begging for money with a cap in hand. And it was mainly when soldiers came back from, I'm not, re I don't remember which war, but how that term got started. But um, I think people, you know, lately are trying to come up with a more positive spin on the word. I mean, disabled doesn't sound like a positive thing, but it's a, it's part of identity. You know, it's what the group, you know, wants to be called. You know, people are reclaiming the word crip, for example, when, you know, crippled in the 50s and 60s was a, a, a terrible word, word. You know, same thing in the gay community. Queer may not sound, you know, like a good word, but that's what the group prefers, you know, to be called. So I exactly. think we have to take our cues from, you know, the individuals that are actually from that group and, and know that terminology is a constantly, you know, evolving thing. Even person first uh, terminology is kind of, you know, a little shaky right now. We used to always told uh, to say people first, people with disability or person who uses a wheelchair, but now it's, you know, disabled person or disabled with a capital D because it's, you know, it is part of our identity. It's not something we want to be sugar-coated or, you know, brushed away. Yeah, the, 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 the language, um, I think, is one of the, um, to me, um, I can describe myself in, as I, identity first. Um, you know, I'm a disabled woman. Um, I, I do that. When I'm addressing a large group, um, especially a group that that I don't know, um, I will say persons with disabilities. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I, you know, people are going always going back and forth. Disability mm -hmm. in Philadelphia, we as an organization are identity first. Obviously, mm -hmm. you're disability proud. So, <laughs> um, it's for us. Right. And there, you know, there used to be a lot more stigma associated with certain types of disabilities. And I think, yes. you know, that's still there, but it's improving somewhat and more, yeah. more people are, you know, more open about their disabilities that sometimes might be invisible. Right. Mental health disabilities and other disabilities. Yes. We're going to have a great conversation about that on Wednesday. Right. Um, hidden disabilities. Yes. Um, there is somebody else with a question. I believe it is Christina Rude. Let me get her here. Chris, Chris are you with us? Saying a couple of things, it's like you, know, you were saying that about the, the police officers and uniforms and everything that. I wonder if that's one of the reasons why we're having so many problems with, with, you know, police brutality and everything like that. Maybe people are just trying to make them look bad. And also, I'm very proud to be a crip. Mm -hmm. 
I think a lot of us are reclaiming the word crip. I kind of like it. I used, I used to call myself a super crip, but <laughs> that probably wasn't appropriate either. Hey, my friend, I got a cousin. Has a t-shirt. <laughs> my friend has a t-shirt. I got a cousin. The Superman, um, the Superman label. Mm -hmm. um, and it actually, instead of saying Superman, it says super crip. Yeah, yeah, I like it. <laughs> I got a cousin, though. I don't think he's disabled, but I swear he's, he would, if he was, he'd be a great crit. Really? <laughs> he'd be a good ally for us. Yeah. We need lots of allies. Thank you, Chris. Do we have any other questions? I'm trying to see if there's anything else here. Oh, let me check on Facebook because I get questions on Facebook. Um, just give me one second. I need to. My I pay. I don't pay attention to it for a few minutes, and then it goes into sleep mode. Here we are. Whoa. <laughs> okay. <laughs> So we have Lucy Bell, who's on Facebook, and she says, first of all, pleather, pleather is so kick-ass. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> um, and then she said, do you consider it collective punishment to restrict the kinds of animals permitted as a service animal? She said, I have a legitimate need and legitimately trained animal um, oops, hold on. That must be, must be the less protected class of ESA because of the law restrictions. Um, what do you think about them like condoning, like, you know, saying that there's, you can have a dog or a, a miniature horse, but you can't have another type of animal that actually can learn and do things for you? Well, it depends. It depends on the animal. I think we're still learning about what, you know, different animals, what they can do. You know, pigs are like supposedly as, far, as smart as dogs or smarter than dogs, but I think we're all learning about, you know, what animals, you know, can do. As, as long as it's legitimately, you know, performing a function and, you know, assisting a, a person with a disability. Yeah, um, you know, I tell people all the time that um, I have some, I, I have had some of the, and not at the moment, but I have had some of the most intelligent cats um, that know certain things. Um, mm -hmm. I always thought that that was, that was a shame. Yeah, and they could be. <laughs> at the ADA Palooza, um, they were showing that there, there's a place called Monkey Helpers. <laughs> yeah, yeah, there's other kinds of animals. They're very smart and they can help people that have quadriplegia and they, you know, uh -huh. they have a lot of manual dexterity. They can do a lot of things. So they, again, there's all kinds of animals. But unfortunately, some people spoil it for the rest of us. I actually have three cats. They would never be service cats. I, I'm at their service. Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah that's, what, that's what a lot of people were saying. They're like, right. you actually service them. You right. just think that they service you. <laughs> they, they'll get around when they feel like servicing you, but I, I serve them all the time. Um, so I have a, a, a comment here. Um, Hunter Anwar, sorry if I... Hunter. Okay. Um, it says, I don't have a question for Wendy, but I just wanted to say that Wendy is my hero. Oh, thank you, Hunter. <laughs> I love Hunter. <laughs> Um, Charlie Carl says, creative riff on other service animals. I'd wish for an octopus, especially trained for massage. <laughs> right. Yeah, that would be good at, at the time of COVID-19 that we can have our own personal octopus massager. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, Very nice. And then Lisa from Facebook said, um, this was wonderful. She wanted, she wants to talk to you about maybe using some of your artwork for lesson plans that they're doing with disability equality in education. Okay. Um, 
as a conversation you guys can have. Okay. I obviously, I work with them also, so. Um, but I think that this was a great conversation. I love all of the all of the cartoons you do. You know that. Yeah, thank you. I have fun doing them. Oh, I bet. And you're an amazing artist. Um, it, not only are the cartoons um, just uh, they're so they're, I, I just they're so lifelike um, and cart. And, you know, in a cartoonish kind of, I don't know, maybe right. I'm right. <laughs> yeah, I also am an oil, oil painter too. I do a lot of portraits and, yes. and some landscapes and uh, photography. Mm -hmm. I know. You like the, you, you do photography where you like get the most extreme like close up of something um, on some of the art, um, some, some of the photography that I saw of yours. Yeah. That, it is so amazing because most people see it from like way back and it's a totally different view if you get really really close to it yeah. and i think that's probably you know a function of being in a wheelchair too it changes the my you know what my vision line is when i when i go out and go out into the yard and you know i see flowers but I, i'm always wanting to take them really close up or you know and and then further you know crop and crop until you until you're not even sure you know what you're looking at, but I, you know, yes. I like to turn things that. into other things. Yes, uh, we did. Um, we had a happy hour with our group at Disability Equality and Education, and we did a little game that was called um, Hot Dogs or Legs, mm -hmm. and it was a bunch of photographs, and you, we had to look at them and figure out whether they were two hot dogs that were sitting together or if they were two legs that were sitting together. And let me tell That's you, great. it was hard to tell some of them. <laughs> That's great. <laughs> so I just want to wrap this up and say thank you so much for being here. Um, we truly enjoyed this conversation and we want to thank our interpreters, Jay and Mimi and our captioner. And we want to, um, can you let us know where they can find more of your work? Uh, sure. If they want to uh, find more of my work, uh, my website, it's um, EV as in Victor, art, A-R-T, dot com, www.wendyevart.com. And you could also email me. My Gmail is Wendy Ev. It's Wendy W E N D Y E V dot artist at gmail dot com. Sounds great. Thank you so much. Thank you. And I again, I want to thank you for the opportunity to share my art and story with you today. And I hope you enjoyed seeing the cartoons. And I hope that you all will feel empowered to tell your own stories through art. Uh, whether it's visual arts or music, uh, performance, poetry, and, and so forth. Um, I think that we have, as a community have a lot to be proud of and our, our voices need to be heard. Exactly. Thank you. Thank you so much, Wendy. And thank you to everybody for coming today. We hope you all enjoyed this. And make sure that you tune in again for our three o'clock, which is uh, a PA Adapt Now. We're going to be talking to young generation adapters about their thoughts on what needs to be done now and in the future. Stay tuned. Thank you, everybody. Bye. Bye, Wendy. Bye. Take care.